Today's presentation will be given by uh, Yun Shuang Chung. Uh, she's currently visiting assistant professor in the Department of Classical and Modern Languages, Literatures, and Cultures at uh, Wayne State University. But after this August, she will be assistant professor at Wayne State, which is very good news. I, um, a few years ago, I had the pleasure of being discussant for one of Yun Chuang's talks. Uh, many talks that she's given at AAS, and I was impressed with the uh, originality of the approach, um, with the uh, depth and detail of the research, uh, and with the transdisciplinary uh, nature of her uh, thinking. If uh, She already has over 10 articles out in journals, uh, book chapters, and other sources. If you look at some of the titles, um, The Boat Space in Song Literary Culture, on the Intellectual Construction of the Space of the Studio in Song Dynasty. So she's looking at space and also material culture, but uh, through, largely through uh, texts um, and a wide range of topics, um, uh, not just space, but uh, food and drink and um, also uh, more um, reclusion and so on. So uh, it's very impressive, but uh, rather than talk further, I think it's better that you hear from Yun Shuang yourself. So if you would join me in welcoming uh, Professor Zhang. So thank you, thank you, Professor Powers, for this kindest introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, so uh, this presentation like, is part of my current book project on the distinctive significance of the studio space, as Professor Powers mentioned. Um, I will mainly, like in my current book project, I will mainly talk about the, how the studio space worked as a like, private space for the literati in, Song, in the Song Dynasty through its uh, both literary and visual representations. Simply speaking, the studio is an enclosed site specifically used for reading and writing and art creation. Uh, the studio is really the very epitome of one's cultural attainment and mind cultivation. But today, I will not just uh, focus on the studio, but I will talk about the attributes of the studio by going beyond the studio, uh, by discussing its relationship with the natural surroundings in Song Dynasty literary and uh, pictorial representations. So when I started my research on this topic, I'm think, I was thinking that are there Chinese terms describing this mutual relationship? Or how did Song literati frame this uh, issue, if they really think this is an issue? And then I found an answer from the case of Sima Guang, a very famous Song literator, Sima Guang, and his famous garden of solitary enjoyment. So let's start from here. In 1071, Sima Guang moved to Luoyang to enact a self-imposed retirement in resistance to the new policies reforms led by Wang Anshi. Two years later, he constructed the Garden of Solitary Enjoyment and composed a well-known account for this garden. In 1077, when Su Shi, another famous literator in the song, when Su Shi was at Xuzhou, he celebrated this garden in his poem, Sima Jun Shi's Garden of Solitary Enjoyment. Sima Jun Shi is the courtesy name of Sima Guang. Uh, this, the, this is just the opening of the poem. It is a comparatively long poem. And we just uh, read the opening part. It says, green hills above the cottage, Flowing water is beneath the cottage. There is five mu garden. Flower and bamboo are elegant yet wild. The fragrance of flowers invades the kine and shoes. The color of bamboo it chews on the wine cup. With a cup of wine, one enjoys the lingering spring. By the chess game, one savors the long summer. 
It is worth noting that Su Shi had not visited the garden when he wrote this poem. Partly because Su Shi was inspired by Sima Guang's account of the garden and wrote the poem drawn by imagination, his depiction of the garden is sketch-like. However, such an outline succinctly points to the key features of garden scenery. As the third and the fourth lines summarize, in the garden, the plants possess characteristics of both elegance and wilderness, so xiu and yi in Chinese. These two notions are similarly contradictory, as the wild emphasizes natural attributes, excluding the processes of human cultivation and caring. The elegant, in contrast, is a result of human operations and intellectual activities. The difference between xiu and yi, in other words, is a manifestation of the distinction between culture and nature. Furthermore, Su Shi integrates these two opposing notions in his overall description of the garden space, indicating that a garden acts as a mediating space between natural forces and cultural activities. Flowers and bamboo, of course, are natural, but as soon as they are planted in the man-made garden, inevitably they are cultivated by intellectual and aesthetic activities. Thus, the use of the descriptive phrase, elegant yet wild, po points precisely to an interaction between nature and culture. The studio as a culture space is often surrounded by scenic beauty, Studios located in mountains or gardens, of course, converse with the natural surroundings. And even though most studio owners lack the material conditions to construct their studio uh, in mountains or gardens, their urban studios are often at least accompanied by a small yard or a pond. Accordingly, if we observe the interplay between nature and culture in the interaction between the studio and the both its immediate surroundings as well as the distant landscape, we will find that this interplay re recurs infinitely rather than functioning simply as a reciprocal process. In literary writings, this interplay is represented as mis omnibium, though which uh, through which nature and culture are continuously framed, transformed, and intertwined. So today in my talk, I will analyze how Song Literati construct nature and culture in and out of the studio space. From the studio to studio-centered mm -hmm. scenery, there must be a border between nature and culture. However, this border lacks stability which marks the difference while at the same time containing dynamic continui continuity. So now let's start from the first part of my talk. So I will structure my talk into uh, four parts. Okay. Let's start from the first part, studio-centered scenery. Su Shi's contemporary Wang Zhifang I once commented on Su Shi's poem uh, the poem that we just read by the Sima Junshi's Garden of Solitary Enjoyment, saying, Dong Po composed the poem on the Garden of Solitary Enjoyment on behalf of the Duke of Wen. In just in the opening four lines, he already expresses the idea fully. These lines read, Green hills above the cottage, flowing waters beneath the cottage, there is a five mu garden, flowers and bamboo are elegant yet wild. This can be directly painted. Indeed, since its construction, the Garden of Solitary Enjoyment had often been commemorated in pictorial form. An anonymous hand scroll, Sima Guang's Garden of Solitary Enjoyment, traditionally dated to the Song Dynasty, can serve as an illustration of Wang Zhifang's comment, as we can see from the screen. Although the painting is far from a visually faithful rendering of Sima Guang's account and the poems describing his garden of solitary enjoyment, in it, 
we can precisely discern the integration of xiu and yi. This painting can be generally divided into three parts horizontally. The middle part is composed mainly of several buildings. The central building, surrounded by various trees in the red circle, is identified as Sima Guang's studio, the hall for reading books. The left part of the painting is occupied mostly by trees, and the right part, including pergolas, um, as you can see here, and then a plus of herbs here <coughs> and here, and a pavilion, uh, a marsh, a bamboo grove, and also a rock here, uh, right uh, behind the pavilion. So all of these things in composition uh, loosely follows Sima Guang's own description of the size in his garden. The left and the right parts of the painting are similarly in contrast, as the left displays a more natural scene, while the right depicts many traces of intervention by human activities. On the right, all the flower beds and herb nurseries are arranged in an orderly fashion. The marsh here uh, is depicted in a special shape, forming an enclosed site with the bamboo grove. And the fantastic rock here stands right beside a pavilion. Even the left part of the painting, however, is, a is not a completely natural scene. Rather, nature is constrained by the dwarf wall that connects the central studio to the left side of the garden. So the wall is here. Moreover, Another fantastic rock, standing in the grove and decorated by banana leaves, further echoes the cultural participation suggested in the depiction of the right side of the garden, and at the same time labels the left side with the characteristic of xiu. Therefore, from this painting, we can observe, first, that the studio is represented as an indispensable part of the garden or even the center of the garden. And second, that the natural scenery here is more or less denaturalized, and therefore the boundary between nature and the culture becomes kind of blurred. This prominent status of the studio within a garden and the theme of the cultural treatment of nature are introduced in much more detail in Sima Guang's account of the Garden of Solitary Enjoyment. Written in 1073, at the time the garden was constructed. In the middle part of the account, Sima Guang introduces all the seven sites in his garden and discusses the design, uh, the function, the scenic features, and the naming of each site. For now, we don't need to read uh, the whole like long paragraph, but line by line. But I just uh, would like to highlight uh, the seven sides right in red, and we can see the structure of the middle part of Sima Guang's account here. Right? So it's just to introduce each side right one after another, starting from the studio right the hall for reading books, and then chamber for playing with water then fishing hut, studio for planting bamboo, plot for picking herbs, okay. and then the pavilion for watering flowers, and finally the terrace for viewing mountains. And after this like introduction of each set, Sima Guang then goes on to describe his uh, daily life among these sites. And this is a, a layout of Sima Guang's garden uh, based on the uh, account. Okay. Mm, as you can see here, the studio right, is again the center, right? it's definitely the center of the whole garden, while the other six sites are juxtaposed to complete uh, the core site. And the following part that describing his daily life among these seven sites reads as this. 
the impractical auditor in his daily life stays most of his time in the hall reading books. Above the model himself on the sages, below he befriends all the verses. He examines the origins of benevolence and righteousness and explores the beginnings of ritual and music. From the time before everything had achieved its form to the scope behind the infinity of going forth in all directions, the principle of phenomena all gather before his eyes. What worries him is that his learning has not reached to the extreme. What else does he need to seek from others or to rely on from the outside? When his mind is exhausted and his body is tired, he then casts a fishing rod to catch fishes, or holds his robe to pick herbs, or digs a channel to provide water for the flowers, or grabs an axe to split bamboo, or washes away the heat and mm -hmm. rinses his hands, climbs through the haze to look as far as his eyes can see. He ambles freely and lingers there, only going along with his whims. If we consider even just this paragraph, it is not hard to see that the studio has absolute priority over all other sites in the garden. In his retirement, Sima Guang spent most of his time in the garden. Only in this way was he able to communicate with the sages and the worthies, delves into the essence of human society and the universe, and finally achieve insights into the principle of mirrored phenomenon. Therefore, it is not surprising that Sima Guang asks rhetorically what else does he need to seek from others or to rely on from the outside. For Sima Guang, in other words, the studio functions as a self-contained space. On the other hand, the studio owner still needs certain auxiliary spaces. So that's the part in blue. Uh, when, felt, uh, when he felt tired of studying, he left the studio to relax among the other sites in the garden. The series of activities that Sima Guang lists in the second half of this paragraph correspond directly to the six sites he designed and modified from nature. How did he cultivate the natural scenery to become part of his intellectual life and shape the gardenscape to integrate natural forces and cultural manipulation? Sima Guang answers this question in the previous paragraphs that we just briefly go through. Uh, so now let's go back to the paragraphs that describe the seven sides. Unlike the painting Garden of Solitary Enjoyment we just enjoyed, uh, which depicts no human figure, this account reflects many traces of human participation. The impractical auditor, uh, that is the self-chosen sobriquet of Sima Guang, um, so by using this uh, self-chosen sobriquet as the persona of Sima Guang here claims uh, to imitate nature. Bamboo groves, herbs, flowers, and even flowing waters and mountains all became parts of the garden. However, this is far from enough. Nature needs to be refined by cultural transformation. By means of craftsmanship, horticultural practices, and scholarly pursuits, the impractical auditor eager, eagerly incorporated the wild into the elegant. For instance, in Sima Guang's description of each scenic site, his frequent use of the phrase like looking like, uh, as if, right, ru or ru in Chinese, reflects his passion for manipulating nature and imitating uh, some like cultural phenomenon. Uh, as you can see here in blue, and also next paragraph, we have several like as, as if. The, another illustration is that the selection of herbs and the flowers, that also contributes to the shift from nature to culture, as we can see from the third paragraph here. The impractical auditor not only carefully selected and ordered the species of plants, but also by identifying their names and features, he labeled them. Our 
next one, recognize. He recognized their names as well as their appearances. Through these activities of naming and labeling, he paid much more attention to the scholarly interests these plants embodied than their aesthetic values. More specifically, here he put into practice the Confucian ideal on plant names. As Confucian said, broadly recognizing the names of birds, beasts, and plants, right, that's a good thing. While Confucians encouraged his disciples to get familiar with uh, names from the classical poetry, Sima Guang further studied them with natural samples. So in this sense, Sima Guang's cultivation of nature can be considered to complement his scholarly pursuits in the hall of reading books. It is an alternative way to observe the principle of phenomenon which he achieved mainly by reading in his studio. In other words, here the studio-centered scenery, which is modified as constrained nature, assists in the fulfillment of the intellectual function of the studio space. In his literary representation of this denaturalized studio-centered scenery, Sima Guang further frames it with cultural images. So now let's move to the second part of my talk, writing the water and the plant. For instance, when Sima Guang composed seven poems on the Garden of Solitary Enjoyment to celebrate the seven sites in his garden, Sima Guang focused on ancient worthies and intellectual activities inspired by these sites given little space to scenic beauty. One example reads as follows. Right? Um, I admire Du Mu Zhi. His manner was fundamentally lofty and refined. He constructed a pavilion that approached the waterside. Splashing and playing with water, he idled away the whole way. One can watch the inkstone in it, which allows one to transcribe poems. One can float one cups on it, which is suitable for an intimate talk when sitting side by side. Don't take the water to wash cap strings. Red dusk defile its pure nature. This poem was written for the chamber for playing with water, which was located directly to the south of the hall for reading books. It could be a poem as celebrating the beauty of the pond and the streams that flowed through the chamber. However, few lines depict the water itself. As part of the studio-centered scenery, the water as well as the chamber is framed through a series of cultural elements. The first half of the poem directly connects the chamber for playing with water with the one constructed more than 200 years earlier by the Tang poet Du Mu. In his position as prefect of Chizhou in modern Anhui province, Du Mu constructed a pavilion for playing with water in the suburban area of Chizhou and composed several poems to celebrate the natural landscape there. However, in his rewriting of Du Mu's appreciation of this landscape, Sima Guang dismisses all the aesthetic images of nature in Du Mu's poems. Setting a single action, playing with water to represent Du Mu's refined manner. Further, he conceives of three specific activities that Du Mu or he himself may perform when playing with water. But none of these three activities is specifically mentioned in Du Mu's writings. The first two activities, washing the inkstone and floating one cups, can be traced back to Wang Xizhi of the Jin Dynasty, who washed the inkstone in a pond after practicing calligraphy and floated one cups on a stream during the gathering at Lanting, right, the famous Lanting gathering. And the third one, right, washing cap string, alludes to the fisherman chapter from the lyrics of Chu. So all these activities Sima Guang selects are typical symbols of intellectual elegance. 
In this way, Sima Guang represents the water through a double lens. He not only observed the water through the eyes of ancient scholars, but also reflect the most typical cultural images to recast the natural. So this is the first example, and you can see it's from uh, it's kind of a recast of natural into some like cultural uh, elements. And in this part, I will give three examples, three poems. This is the first one, and the second one is a is just a reverse it, right? It's uh, recast cultural elements by means of certain cultural images. So now let's see. Cultural activities can also be conveyed by Song Literati through the view of studio-centered scenery. F mm, this is the second poem, a well-known quotient by Zhu Xi, right, the new Confucianist <coughs> Zhu Xi. It reads, a half moon square pond opened like a mirror. Brightness of the sky and shadow of clouds both wonder. I ask, how can it be clear like this? It is because from its source, the living water comes. On the surface, this poem shares the pond theme with that written by Sima Guang. A small pond is as clear as a mirror reflecting the sky and clouds in movement. The poet wonders how the pond water can be so clear. He finally finds the reason. The inexhaustible source of the water continuously replenishes the pond, guaranteeing its purity. However, the poem is about more than a pond. As Zhu as Xi pointed out in a letter to his disciple Xu Sheng, this poem, in fact, talks about the process of learning and cultivation. So we can see the circulated title, right, added later, is feeling while reading, right, Guan Shu Yu Gan. So as this circulated title suggests, the poem is inspired by the practice of reading. In this sense, the pond is a metaphor for the mind. The mind can maintain its clearness only when there is flowing water constantly coming from its source, that is, knowledge acquired from reading. Thus, although the main text does not mention reading, the poem indeed works as a vivid illustration of the experience of reading. As we can see, the imagery of the small pond allows visualization of an indefinable feeling arising from intellectual practice, making it much more explicit. This process, of course, is closely related to the way of observing phenomena in the teaching of Neo-Confucianism. But at the same time, it can be understood in terms of the connection between the studio and the studio-centered scenery. Cultural activities mainly performed in the studio are represented as naturalized in some manner through the surrounding scenery. So this is like a reverse direction, right? And then let's turn to the third poem right, in this part. So sometimes the studio and its immediately immediate surroundings are even more intertwined in literary representations. So I would like to use another poem by Su Shi as the example. This poem is entitled Book Chamber, right? The studio uh, named, is named Book Chamber. And it reads, rain darkens the inkstone with the color of cold clouds. Wind stirs every book text with the sound of taggles of leaves. In the courtyard, the hook ribbon grass has grown. I suspect you, the governor, are Zheng Kangcheng. This quotient is actually a companion piece to a poem with the same title by Su Shi's close friend Wen Tong. As the prefect of Yangzhou in modern Shanxi province, that Yangzhou, Wen Tong constructed or renovated 30 sites in Yangzhou and composed a poem for each site. The studio named the Book Chamber is among them. 
Wen Tong's original poem on it reads as that. So clear spring surrounds the courtyard. Green and small bamboo brightens the balustrade. Sitting here, what am I able to do? It is only suited for playing with the lead pencil and wooden tablet. This poem, right, Wen Tong's poem, is clearly divided into two parts. The first couplet depicts the outside of the studio. A clear spring and a green bamboo encircle the studio and provide it with a secluded environment. The second couplet points out straight forwardly to the activity performed inside the studio. The studio, it asserts, is only good for intellectual practices such as writing. Wen Tong structured the poem to emphasize the separation of the studio and its surrounding scenery. There is little communication between the culture and the natural. Su Shi's co companion piece, conversely, blurs the boundary between natural images and cultural images. In the opening couplet, Su Shi immediately invites both the natural, right here is the ruin, and the wind, and the culture, that is the ink stone and the book text, on the stage. The ruin and the wind outside the studio directly affect scholarly objects within the studio, respectively. As a result, a color of cold clouds arises. We are not sure whether this color is the ink stone's reflection of dark uh, ruin clouds in the sky, or a metaphor for the surface color of the ink stone in the shroud of ruin. It may even simply imply both. <coughs> in the same way, the sound of tangles of leaves in the second line may refer to the rustle of leaves in the courtyard, or it may metaphorically describe the sound of book text as swaying in the wind, or both. In fact, we don't need to decide the specific reference of these two phrases. Such ambiguity fully reflects the interplay between natural scenery and typical studio objects. In a different way, but a similar interplay is depicted in the second couplet. The view of the poet stops first at the grass in the yard. However, the grass is not a common type. Although Su Shi had not yet visited the garden, uh, visited the studio, okay, again, he hadn't visited that when he composed this poem, he imagines the grass must be book ribbon grass, Shu Dai Cao. Such a name connects the plant with the great Confucian scholar Zheng Xuan of Eastern Han Dynasty. It is said that when Zheng Xuan lived and taught at Mount Buqi, a special grass grew at the foot of the mountain. The blade of the grass was more than one chi in length, and the grass was extremely firm and tassel. The local people called it the book ribbon of Kang Cheng. This name compares the long grass of the ribbon used to make books, and therefore endows the natural image with scholarly interest. Hence, by inserting this anecdote into the last two lines, Su Shi not only praises Wen Tong for his learning, which he suggests is as profound as that Han scholar uh, Zheng Xuan, but more importantly, he wittily bridges the studio-centered scenery and the academic function of the studio. In short, natural images and the cultural images can be smoothly intertwined in literary representations of the studio. The natural effects and moreover records the culture, while at the same time, the culture constantly frames and defines the natural with an intellectual interest. And Song literati would often further frame this cultivated nature through the studio window. So now let's turn to the third part of my talk today, right through the studio window. Such a tendency is often explicit in pictorial materials. 
So let's start from the several album leaves in the Song Dynasty. So the Song album leaves depicts a studio uh, located in seasonal scenery, capture the moment when the studio owner's eyes fall leisurely on the natural scene through the window. For instance, this one, right, Liu Songnian's reading the Book of Changes by the autumn window. We can see that a scholar sitting uh, at his writing desk in front of the studio window. On the desk are books here. Yeah, it's kind of small. Uh, are books, some put in pile and one open, as well as a tripod incense burner here. Um, but the painting, instead of portraying the scholar reading, catches the occasion when his eyes are temporarily drawn from his books to the outside. The outside scenery includes mountains and the flowing waters in the distance, as well as around the studios, green pines, red maples, and the rocks here and here. Okay. And then another album leaf, reading in the Willow Hall, is similar composed, but the scene outside the window constitute a greater portion of the image. The studio window allows the scholar to enjoy the multi-layered scenery from the grove on the opposite bank here to a distant body of water to willows, pines, and the rocks here inside the garden fence. So this is the pictorial representation of the use of the studio window. And in literary representations, Song literati were also interested in employing this particular view of the window to observe the studio-centered scenery. Let's read Zheng Gangzhong's poem as an example. Right, Zheng Gangzhong conveyed this interest in his poem, Summer Day in the Studio. And this is a comparatively long poem. It reads, the fifth month troubles people with heat and humidity. The masses thought that it was like steaming or cooking. It was only me who sat in a secluded hall. My mind followed what it pleased. Opening the window, I faced the western mountains. Wild water became calm in the clear pond. Water cultures and lotuses alternated with cattails and reeds. Their elegant beauty reflected on each other. Quiet birds were under the shade of beautiful trees. Waterfall flew up and down from time to time. Books were explored at will. The wind was so gentle with fragrance like strands of silk. This, of course, carries the ultimate pleasure. It is hard to make commoners understand. The overall leisurely atmosphere of this poem is similar to that of the two album leaves. It also centers on a scholar sitting idly in the studio and exquisitely captures the seasonal scenery through the framework of the studio window. But unlike the paintings discussed above, this literary work represents the framed scenery directly from the viewpoint of the lyric eye who is sitting by the window at the studio. The opening four lines attract the reader's attention to the secluded hall, which refers to the studio, and establish a contrast between the masses and the, po the poet. While the masses are tortured by summer heat, the poet enjoys self-satisfaction in his personal studio. The following six lines explain why the studio is so comfortable. Opening the window brings cool temperatures uh, and splendid scenery inside the studio. By virtue of opening the window, the landscape both distant vistas and immediately surroundings, is completely framed and thus become integrated into the studio-centered scenery. Even the wild water, uh, again we have the yi, uh, wild water, is denaturalized to become part of the pond 
and accompanied the other elegant beauty. Again, we have the shield to decorate the studio. After depicting the studio window as an indispensable medium for the poet's appreciation of scenery, the next two lines of summer day in the studio further connects the inside and the outside of the window. When reading at leisure, the studio owner can feel gentle breezes coming through the window and appreciate pleasant natural smells from outside. Finally, the closing lines of the poem first indicate that the common masses find it difficult to understand the pleasure of the studio, pro, uh, the pleasure that studio provides, echoing the contrast between commoners and the studio owner set in the opening lines of the poem. Moreover, use of the term ultimate pleasure, zhi le, reminds readers of Ouyang Xiu's famous claim in regard to the studio. Ouyang Xiu's line reads, the ultimate pleasure under heaven, it is hard, um, uh, it's there, right? uh, it is being at the writing desk all day. By means of this double echo, the poet situates his own studio in the larger context of the enjoyment of the studio space shared by Song Literati. At the same time, besides the focus on the inside of the studio, especially the writing desk in Ouyang Xiu's statement, here the poet adds the window as another crucial element of the studio. In this minor, the studio window provides a framework that enables visualization of the intellectual transformation of nature. Nevertheless, the interaction between culture and nature does not stop here. Song Literati had a penchant not only for viewing flowers outside the window, but also for arranging them inside the studio. The scholar Yang Zhishui has observed that in the studio of Song, poets, um, the flower vase becomes an important decoration, indicating elegance, right, ya. Yeah. As a section, so now let's turn to uh, the part in the vase, right, the last part of my talk today. So let's again start from a painting, a section from the reading, reading the Book of Changes by the Cold Window. As this uh, section reveals, although there was snow-covered landscape outside, the scholar sitting by the studio window here uh, reading the book did not forget to put a branch of plum blossoms in a vase on his writing desk. So here, there are actually only a vase of flower and a, the book right, reveal. Uh, on the writing desk. And Chao Gong Su's poem, On Plum Blossoms in a Bronze Vase, represents a very similar scene in literal fashion and explains the implication of the vase of flowers. So this quote reads, Picking the chill scents, at dusk I returned. In a bronze vase, I added water to nourish the crossing branch. By the studio window, at one night, the moon had just become full. It was exactly like the moment that the small stream was clear and shallow. The poem tells the process of appreciating a vase of plum blossoms in the studio. Between dusk and moonrise, the poet first brings a fragrant branch of plum blossoms from outside into his studio in the first line. Then he arranges the branch in a bronze vase. And finally, he enjoys it as, the, as he reposes by the studio window. In the first couplet, from picking to nourishing, the poet explicitly outlines his tending of the branch. By means of human intervention, natural growth is cultivated. What is the implication of this cultivated nature then? The second couplet interprets it metaphorically. 
The moment the vase of flowers is set by the moonlit studio window is the same moment when the plum. Oh, sorry, still here. Right, it's the same moment when the plum tree was beside a clear and shallow stream. At first glance, it seems that the poet compares man-made nature with a natural setting, and thus is able to claim the very similitude of his design. But the phrase "the small stream is clear and shallow" xiao xi qing qian, accompanied by mentions of the chill scent, the crossing branch, and the moon, is in fact Another direct echo of a famous Song literatus Lin Bu's renowned couplet on plum blossom, as you can see here. This couplet by Lin Bu was broadly acknowledged by Song literati as the ideal literary appreciation of plum blossoms. Therefore, by making this comparison, the poet. Elevates his vase of flowers to the idealized status of plum blossoms shared by Song Literati. In so doing, he successfully transforms the originally natural image again into an emblem of literati elegance. So the process of Mies and Nabim is thus mirrored here, from the landscape outside to the studio-centered scenery, and finally to the inside of the studio. Multiple natures are represented in the works of Song Literati. Surrounding the studio space, the natural is framed by cultural elements. Following this, the framed nature is still considered as another layer of nature, and is further recasted, recast into cultural subject. This interaction is constantly performed by means of the construction of the studio-centered scenery, the literary representation of natural images, and the framework of the studio window. At the end, it is projected on a single vase of flowers in the studio. The wild is finally transformed into a miniaturized elegance. So that is my talk today. Thank you for your attention, and welcome to our comments and questions. So thanks for that elegant sort of curation or cultivation of nature and culture through, throughout these poems and, and images, I, I just want to, I'm going to be a little provocative here and say, well, actually, I don't see any nature or any culture in any of this. What I, what I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what would happen if you bracketed those terms out and instead of using them uh, and sort of lining up elements under them and seeing where they blur or where they're bounded, um, sort of... Instead, look at the terms themselves that you're lining up and see if they might, without nature and culture, scatter or, um, or go into more complex configurations. I, I'm saying this because when I'm looking at the poems and the images, and I'm, I'm no, I, I don't know anything about any of this, what, what I see instead of nature and culture are walls and rooms that are that seem to be created for the purpose of um, of making the conditions for reading and writing possible, and they seem to be inscribing the conditions for reading and writing into these gardens and landscapes. So uh, repeatedly, there are these square bounded forms uh -huh. and a kind of way of concentrating, you know inside that form and a way of expanding outside that form that seems to reflect the process of reading where you're concentrating on these you know this square page or you know rectangular page yet on the other hand you you're, you're required to have this expansive 
free wandering mind at the same time. So there's an inside and an outside to that, that walls and square forms, window, window, um, the, the studio window, all of that seems to be kind of reinscribing and reflecting. And then what's also striking is how they're, um, everybody's writing about this and painting this all the time, which is the only reason you can even say this, is the only reason we even know about it. So it's not just that, that um, writing is being sort of set up and contemplated, it's that it's also being reinscribed and rewritten over and over here as those conditions. So, yes. I mean, to me, that is a little more compelling actually than the curation of nature and culture that you're doing, even though I do appreciate that. Yes, so thank you for the question. Um, yes, I totally agree that um, my current project really focuses on the significance of the studio space. So this interaction between nature and the culture is actually the, the, the last chapter of that whole project. So what I concentrate on is really like the this amazing like reputation right the continuity of writing about the practice the intellectual practices of reading writing and art creation um, but as the closing part of my research uh, i would like to just discuss a little bit about like how they frame the, this all these cultural activities so that's why i um, like end my project by discussing this interplay between nature and culture. And actually I have a section just uh, exactly called uh, Frame the Nature, Frame the Culture. So it's really the walls, the windows, uh, and the, the just the all kinds of boundaries, right? Uh, in the garden or in the studio really are very, very crucial, right? To, kind of have an inclusion and an exclusion of uh, the activities uh, in this particular space, yes. Hey, Yinfeng, thank you for, uh, for this talk and for sharing all these wonderful images and poems. Um, I wonder, I, I actually agree with, with a lot of what, what Eric says, uh, and so I want to continue pressing you on this. Um, and I think one way of, of doing this is to say that I think some of your, this dichotomy of, of nature and culture derives from your insistence that, you know, that there is a real studio, it's a real space where, you know, in which people behave in a certain way and these poems and paintings tell us something about that actual space. Mm -hmm. um, but as Eric says, right, these things are continuously inscribed and so in the paintings and writings that we have, you might say that the representation actually precedes the built space. So even as these gardens are made and as these studios are made, they are already textual. And that's very clear, right? For example, in Sima Guang's poems and his commemoration of his garden, right, that he, that these sites that existed in Luoyang were intended as literary illusions. So they were already textual yes. by the time they were built, right? And so, <laughs> I guess it makes sense to you know to talk about Misan and Bim and and this dynamic, but the dynamic precedes the building. It's not a result of the building. Um, does that make sense, Eric? To is sort of as what you were saying? Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Because I'm from uh, the literature field, so yes, uh, all the materials here is already like are already text and it's all I talked here is actually the literary representations, right, of uh, the studio space. So yeah, that's why I have a section called the how to write, right, all these things. So uh, I'm aware of this uh, and, but um, yes, so basically all of them are already like written by the literatis in the Song Dynasty, and what I'm 
uh, focusing on as just uh, the represent literal representations. On the question of boundaries in space, I, on the contrary to Eric, thought that there was rather a lack of walls. So I think of gardens like the character as an abounded space. Most of these visual images did not uh, stress that at all. Um, and so also people go to gardens and, and see how they're set up. Typically they try and break up the space so they make a small space look bigger. But none of the visual images seem to be interested in portraying that at all. So presumably we have here a very visual way of presenting a garden that would not necessarily have that much to do with how actual gardens work. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's a very, uh, I think, inspiring suggestion. And actually in my project, I discussed the imagination of the studio space. So uh, what I showed today is basically the, the, the physical uh, studio space. But you know, uh, literatists cannot just uh, stay in their physical studio all the time. So they really need to go out like for set scene or for like official business. So at that time, they are still like construct an imaginary studio in their mind or by uh, a couple of like op studio objects. So that's really a very interesting phenomenon in their writings that they uh, are eager to construct uh, a uh, imaginary studio in their mind and thus can still like enjoy the private life, like intellectual life in this space, yes. Also curious about one of the last images you had with a cold window. Mm -hmm. The structure was what? Yes. Basically a roof with four pillars. And then you could see that how the space was divided when they wanted to was to lower that uh, textile. And so is that really a window that we're looking at there? Uh, yes. Would that be understood as a window? Mm -hmm. You had the image a second ago, oh, but maybe you're looking for a different image. Uh, this one. I was actually thinking of the later image that you had mm -hmm. that oh. specifically mentioned cold window, near yes, the end of the one. talk. Mm -hmm. That one there. So it <laughs> looks like a tingsa where you could just let down the cloth there and then close the space up if you wanted. I would not personally call that a window at all, but. Um. <laughs> yes, but you know the frame, um, at least there is the frame, right? Yeah. And I think we can loosely uh, consider it as the window and the, the name, but of course the name is added later, right? But the, the, uh, those who are entitled t this painting, right, called it Reading Changes by the Cold Window, right, mm. so. Um, so if you bought a kit to make something like this, in the blueprints you wouldn't find it says window, right, but, <laughs> but anyway. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, huh? I think um, one of the distinctive features of um, post Song Chinese gardens that was noticed by Europeans in the 18th century is that the, the openings to the outside were designed specifically to make the interpenetration of interior space and exterior space easier. And some of these we would call windows and others were pavilions like this. But I, w I wanted to get back to the nature culture thing which begins with drawings of Right, uh, Zhuangzi that really problematizes this as artifice versus natural, and then it gets um, reinscribed by Tao Yuanming in the fifth century. Yes. Bai Juyi and other and Song Dynasty Gu Wen poets pick up on this, right? And I um, so that it you know this has a long tradition in China, much longer I think than in the West. In the West, it's a much later thing, but um, in the Du Lu. A Yuan mm -hmm. poem, he makes a specific reference to Zhuangzi, right? He's, he mentions Xiaoyao, yes. mm -hmm. right? And also, um, it, what I'm really getting at is a, a kind of underlying theme in the Du Le Yuan, which I'm, I'm sure you've thought of, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that, and that is repeated images of, um, 
of liberation or freedom, like Zong Mu, right? Xiao mm -hmm. Yao, uh, right? Um, and also the transgression of social boundaries. I mean, here's a guy who is one of the greatest statesmen in, in the nation, and he's out there getting his hands dirty, right, digging and in the garden. Right? These are things I can't imagine Horace Walpole doing, for example, in, in, his, uh, in his garden. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just, and Yi, for example, you mentioned in, in another case, what was the term, um, something Yi. In any case, oh, and uh, one other thing I wanted to mention in regard with that, do translated as solitary, but it also means independent mm -hmm. and is sometimes used as a gloss for private. I've seen it used as a gloss for sl, right? Yes. So anyway, I wonder if you, you, you know, if those themes which seem to be kind of um, woven into the poem, I is this something you've thought about or what are your views on that? Yes, yes, yeah. Actually, Professor Powers covers lots of issues <laughs> uh, in your comment. Thank you for that. So yes, yeah, I, in my project, I also explore the prehistory of the studio space. Um, I, I focus on the Song Dynasty not because I'm only working on the Song Dynasty, it's because it, it was from the Song Dynasty that the studio space become uh, so prominent. Uh, in s literary writings. So that's really the starting point of this new cultural phenomenon. Mm, but for the prehistory of the studio space, indeed, like Zhuangzi, Tao Yuanming, uh, Bai Juyi, probably also Du Fu, right, because the, the thatched heart. So all these are treated as prehistory. And uh, in all their writings, there is n no like f specific concentration on the studio, right, the Shu Zhai, that particular space. So they may treat it as a, as a garden or just a place for with freedom or liberation, but they really does not uh, pay special attention on that particular uh, Shu Zhai space. Uh, so that's the first uh, c response I would like to say. And the second one, yes, for the Du Le, the solitary or independent pleasure right, is really from the allusion of Zhuangzi. And uh, actually, I only talk about the middle part of this account by Sima Guang, but the opening part and the closing part, right, how the, he framed this account of the garden, actually mainly discuss the relationship between Du Le, right, solitary pleasure, and shared pleasure, right, Zhong Le. So that's also alludes to monks, right? Yeah, so it's related to the Confucian ideals that how to treat this private space, right? And the public contrib uh, contribution uh, to the society. So that's really Sima Guang's concern in this account. Mm, yes. Thank you very much for your talk today. It occurred to me, and, and listening to it as, as we progressed from the moment you mentioned the impractical oldster, mm -hmm. that all of the products, yes. the, uh, the poems, the paintings, are all a product of the mind of a whole cadre of impractical oldsters, <laughs> yes. many of whom are in this room, I believe. Uh, and I, I would aspire to that role myself. But the idea that uh, he ambles freely and lingers there only going along with his whims, that seems like an ideal way to live. <laughs> and, and maybe that's the only way to live if you're able to uh, produce beauty and knowledge like this. Yes, yes, I agree. And it's, uh, it's the, I think it's, that's not special for Sima Guang, yes. Yeah. And it's, it's really shared. Uh, by song literati, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. How do I convince my wife to let me become a uh, <laughs> impractical oldster? Mm. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I need <laughs> to know your <laughs> wife first. <laughs> mm. She doesn't say you have to catch fish to do it. I really doubt whether that is <laughs> for food. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your lecture. Uh, so uh, I just want to know more about the nature meaning 
Uh, you know, the nature is in, in, in other points. It's not uh, uh, wide or original nature. It's human, I mean, human nature. Uh, yes. Especially in Chinese uh, classical paintings, you know every mountain, water, flower, bamboo—I mean pine or everything—there are so many simple, simple meanings. So what is different in Song Dynasty's nature uh, is different from Tao Yuanming or I mean uh, another dynasty. So what is special simple meaning? Not only reading uh, the space, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I want to know more about the nature's meaning or symbol meanings. So, yeah. Thank yes, you. yes. I think I can answer the question in different aspects. Uh, first is that I think um, the nature here for Song literati, the Song literati, the, the Mm, their characteristics is that they really pay great attention on intellectual activities. So the nature, that's why I choose the, I made the uh, term that the studio-centered scenery. So the, the nature, right, the scenery is really, they, they serve the culture space of the studio. So that's kind of the, the culture space has the priority, and then the nature is just surrounded and complement to it. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that um, previously, like Zhuangzi or Tao Yuanming's nature, I think is more connected to the, uh, to the Taoist values. So it's connected to the concept of reclusion. But in the Song Dynasty, we see that from all these examples, the, uh, the nature is kind of uh, I just mentioned that the allusion here, right, for the garden's name is that uh, it's m more alludes to monks rather than Zhuangzi. So it's really have a transition here. They pay more attention on the Confucian values uh, rather than the Taoist ideas. Yes, yes. I, I know you raised your <laughs> hands. Thank you for, for, for such an interesting talk. Mm -hmm. um, I had a sort of a more literary question, quite sort of a general question. Mm -hmm. um, and this is sort of coming out of thinking about similar sorts of practices in, in late imperial China. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of interested in what you think are some of the different functions, uh, prose writing on the studio versus poetic writing on the studio mm -hmm. perform at this time. Particularly because I feel um, the sort of prose genres like inscriptions and uh, records and th these kinds of more sort of public official commemorative genres, there's really this interest in naming. So the, the question mm -hmm. is ex sort of explaining the name for the studio, justifying the name for the studio, um, giving this sort of public defense of why a studio is being built, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a commemorative mode of writing. And then with some of the poems, I was really interested in how kind of generic the description of the studio was, how there wasn't really this interest in naming, there wasn't this interest in sort of identifying the meaning behind the name of the studio, it was just in sort of creating this mm -hmm. kind of ambience or this sort of um, uh, picture of the kind of the fusion of nature and culture. So I was just wondering in general if you could reflect a little bit on whether you see differences between prose and poetic writing at this time, whether that maps on to sort of different ideas about public versus private mm -hmm. personas for the studio or for the person occupying the studio. I know, I know that's quite a sort of a vague general question. <laughs> I'd just be interested yes. to hear your thoughts about why, what poetry does differently from these other genres. Yes, yeah, that's really a broad question. <laughs> so basically, because I mentioned that this is a starting point, right, in writing studio, in literary text. So um, I use both like uh, the prose materials and the, the uh, poetic uh, text. And I would say that y the issues right you mentioned like got really flourished in the Ming, especially late Ming dynasty uh, are generally discussed in prose yeah for example the naming of the studio they will write they would write a particular account or just to uh, interpret and uh, explain explain uh, the reason why they select this name and even the the change of name as right, kind of dramatic process of naming uh, their own studios. Um, so I think, yeah, the late Ming phenomenon really derives from the Song literary writings and from from the prose. 
And for poetic interpretations, they um, they talk little about the like specific reasons about like um, about the construction of the studio or the naming of the studio. They may talk more about, for example, one theme right appeared in uh, poetic in poetic materials. Uh, they uh, they really would like to set a boundary right, about the. Uh, dif distinction between the private studio and the uh, public outside. Yes, that's one of the main themes they discussed in poems. Yes. Mm. One more question before we have to end for today. Thank you for your talk. I have a question specifically related to this passage. Okay. I'm just wondering uh, how the broader context of commercial culture plays into this, your topic or your investigation. Because all these uh, description of studio and uh, the physical surroundings just remind me uh, Liu Yuxi's Lo Shi Ming, mm -hmm. right? This sense of humbleness, this sense of simpleness seems gone in their writing. Uh, they seem to turn to this enhanced sensibility of the physical space. Mm -hmm. Just wondering, what do you think? That's probably because of this genre here. Actually, in other, like for example, Biji, right, writings, the anecdotes about the construction of this garden of solitary enjoyment, the, uh, it mentions that about the commercial aspect of the construction of the garden. Uh, actually, Sima Guang does, did not have enough money to, uh, to, to purchase the land and the construct the garden, so, uh, but, he had a high reputation, so all the other literatis right, just uh, collected uh, like money for him, and then he was successfully like constructed this one, uh, this garden in Luoyang. And um, yes, uh, there are also like from other BG records, it really talks about the humble uh, aspect of this garden. Actually, for example. Um, Luoyang Mingyuanji, right, the famous garden, the accounts of famous gardens in Luoyang, right, written by Li Gefei, right, Li Qingzhao's father. Uh, in his uh, writings, he mentioned that, oh, this garden is actually very humble. As it, he also mentioned that this account described in a gorgeous way. That's really, uh, again, right, Im imagination. So, but actually, it's the smallest garden in Luoyang. And it's very humble, but still people like it because of the morality of the owner. Right? So, um, but uh, by the way, Lo Shi Ming, that's a very interesting text. And uh, actually it's, it's put in question that whether it's written by Liu Yuxi or not, right? But so we actually don't know whether it's a Tang Dynasty text or not. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, thank you for all your questions.